Good afternoon. Thanks for coming to the Nobel Prizes. We're on prize number three today, the prize in physics. Our speaker is um, Walter Wynn, and he is the person that if you have any problems with the Institute of Learning Retirement, he's the one to speak to because he is presently the the chair of the ILR board of directors. So beyond that, he got his PhD in physics, uh, I guess it was in physics at Cornell University. Um, but he is a native of Gainesville. In fact, his family came from North Dakota in 1911 and they've lived here ever since. So he has certain standing. He went to the Naval Academy and then, while in the service, uh, went to Cornell University, where he was promoted twice. Very few of us can say that about our graduate years. Um, and um, he was involved with submarines and the development of uh, all sorts of fancy, fancy uh, military uh, advances. And so we're very welcome that he is here now, out of uniform, to talk to you about this Nobel Prize in Physics, which was given to three, that's the maximum number, the three contributors for experimental methods that generate attosecond pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. And so just a few minutes ago, I looked up attosecond, He'll probably repeat this. An attosecond is a unit of time in the international system of units equal to 10 to the minus 18th of a second, one quintillion of a second. An attosecond is to a second what a second is to about 31.7 billion years. That boggles the mind. When? Walter? Well, thank you for that. Uh, I did get two promotions while I was at Cornell because when you start off as an officer in the Navy, if you're alive 18 months later, you get promoted to Lieutenant Junior grade. I had one classmate who failed for promotion of that. I'm not sure why. He went on to drive commercial ships. Um, and then I got promoted to Lieutenant and then I got promoted to engaged and the next year promoted to married. So, but then I went back into the Navy. Well, I was in the Navy the whole time. So I bored holes in the ocean a lot. Uh, I, my dissertation was in experimental nuclear reactor physics. We had a little reactor at Cornell and I would tear it apart, put it back together, make measurements and my hands load at night, that sort of a thing. So today we're gonna to talk about the Nobel Prize in Physics. And uh, there we go. So let's see what the next slide will bring us. Oh dear, looks like I brought the wrong set of slides. Oh. Uh, but but this will be more interesting than the physics one anyway. Uh, this is about a sailing trip I took. Carol and I went with our son in the Caribbean. Um, didn't have anything to do with physics, but let's see, maybe we get lucky here. April Fool. <laughs> so these are the three winners of the prize. So it's Pierre Augustini from France and Lullier from France and Sweden and Florence Krauss, Hungary and Austria for experimental methods that generate attosecond asterisk pulses of light for the study of electron dynamics in matter. And we're gonna talk about that. And by the time this is all over, you'll understand it thoroughly or be asleep. So Pierre, he was born in Tunis. PhD from X, it's X. I found out when we were there. It's not 
I or Ikes or anything. It's X, like eggs. Eggs Marseille University professor at the Ohio State University. Anne Louillier, born in Paris, PhD from University Pierre and Marie Curie, Paris, France. Professor at Lund University, Sweden. Florence Krauss, born in 1962 in Moore, Hungary, PhD 91, as you can see, Vienna University of Technology, director at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics, Garching, or maybe it's Garching, and professor at Lundwig Maximilians. Okay, so that prize, we're gonna talk a little bit about how do you win a Nobel Prize in physics? What do you have to do to win one? First, you can, uh, let's look at a few of the old prize winners. Since the first prize in 1901, we'll review a short duration light pulses, which we're gonna talk about today. Review the terminology for extremely large and small because they're terms that we don't run into day to day, and we'll forget them as soon as we leave the room. Review recent related prize winners. Look at the technology of short pulses. How do you make them? What can you do with them? Look at a short movie illustrating the experimental results that they uh, got for the use of this very short pulse. Okay, how do you win a Nobel Prize in physics? you discover something new or important in science. And if you look at the first guy, Rankin, he discovered radiation, but he didn't know what it was. There it was, it made a picture on his film and he messed it up and that was worth a Nobel Prize. Perform an experiment with unexplained results, that was kind of the same thing. Then you can develop a theory that explains the unexplained results, and you can get a Nobel Prize for figuring out why that guy did what he did and what it means. Or you can develop a conjecture that suggests something not yet seen. And then somebody can develop an experiment that proves that theoretical conjecture was correct. Think of the Higgs boson and the measurements they made at CERN a few years ago to prove that there is a Higgs boson. Okay, you can develop an experiment that improves the results of other Nobel Prize winners by orders of magnitude. So that's what the 2023 Nobel Prize is about. They developed something that was three orders of magnitude, better, shorter, than the guys did it before. Okay, first winner, Rankin, some other easily recognized winners, three Curies, Pierre, Marie, and the daughter, Irene. Michelson, US Navy graduate, he was did his experiments at the Naval Academy on the speed of light. Marconi, you well know about him and, uh, and his uh, co-recipient of the prize, for developing um, radio telegraphy. Planck, Planck's constant. Einstein, what did Einstein win the Nobel Prize for? John, you're not allowed to answer. Anybody know what he won the Nobel Prize for? Yes. Exactly. He was, it was on the uh, explanation of the photoelectric effect and the quantization of the electrons given off by that. Uh, Bohr, another grant, these are giants of the early 20th century doing their theoretical physics and experimental physics. Uh, Fermi, Pauli, Cherenkov was his explanation of why an electron can go faster than the speed of light, because the rule is you can't go faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. Electrons given off in nuclear reactors exceed the speed of light in water. 
and I've seen that at Cornell. We had a, one of the reactors uh, was able to go super critical, and it, you would have a flash of really beautiful blue light, and that's Cherenkov radiation. Feynman, uh, recent, well, in our lifetimes, recent, uh, in the 50s and 60s. Hans Bethe, I think I mentioned to you some years ago that uh, it was not until after I was Hans Bethe's student that he actually received the Nobel Prize. Uh, I didn't understand what he was talking about, though. And the Higgs boson and Penrose working with uh, uh, black holes, possible radiation from black holes. So these are some of the giants. So historical uses of lights of a short duration, a few nanoseconds or microseconds, milliseconds, or just a flash. So the gasoline timing light, if any of you were backyard mechanics like I was, you would have used a timing light on the old automobiles where you had a distributor and the spark plugs came out of the distributor and you could move the distributor around a little bit and that would change the timing of when the sparks actually went off in the engine. And you needed to know the optimum place to do that. And you had a timing light. The timing light, the big red coil, you hooked around the number one spark plug and you hooked the rest to the battery. And whenever the engine was running and the number one spark plug fired, you got a flash of light from that and you could look down on the, the uh, edge of the flywheel, which was really close to the fan belt and the fan for the radiator and the generator. And it was a lot of fun to not get your fingers down in there while you were looking and you just adjusted it. So that was a flash of light. Automobile tire balancing. When I was a kid here in Gainesville, my dad had the Amico station on Northwest 13th Street. And among other things, besides selling gas, uh, he did sell tires and batteries and that sort of a thing. But if you sell someone a tire, and like now you go and get a tire for your car, they will balance it for you. But in those days, we had a little electric motor that would spin the wheel on the car. And there's an arm that reached up under the car after it's jacked up. And when it was heavy, the heavy part as it was rotating, it would go down and that would trigger a flash and we could see exactly where the heavy part was and we could put a weight on the opposite part of the tire to balance the tires. So that was another flash. So determining the RPM of machinery when you're in an electric motor place or in a manufacturing plant and you wanna know how fast some shaft is moving, you get one of these little flasher things and it will sync up with the, and when you stop the motion by adjusting the little dial so that the thing looks like it's standing still, you can read the RPM off the gauge. Another use of flashing light, stop action photography. We've all seen some really stop action early days. They wanted to know which horse's feet landed first when they were galloping and they had a, a very high speed uh, camera that would take a picture. You could then see from the motion picture how the feet were going. And if they're running alongside the racetrack, you can't tell that. Emergency vehicle flashing lights, the ones that we see at looking out our back window nearly every night going over to the health pavilion. And there's um, multiple uses of those. And we all remember the old thing on the bubble gum machine on top of the cops cars. It wasn't a flashing light, it was a rotating light. That's because we're old enough to see these things, if we can remember. Precision component manufacturing. If you have a laser with short burst lights, you can actually carve out something on a piece of metal or whatever you're manufacturing with extremely high precision. So you're using a laser or a flashing light to do that. Laser eye surgery. How many of us have had laser eye surgery? <laughs> a whole bunch of us. So 
I had it. <clears throat> I had it. I was down in uh, Citrus County where we lived, and my doctor said, uh, we're going to have to treat your eye with a laser. I said, okay, when do we do that? He says, follow me. And I walked down the hall, and I sat down, and he had this machine, and he said, okay, you're done. You don't feel it. It's a little, you think you feel it, but you don't. LIDAR, light it, or laser imaging, detecting, and ranging. It's the light equivalent of radar, and it's exactly the same kind of a system. You send a pulse of light, or you send a radar electromagnetic pulse. It'll go out, it'll bounce off something, it'll come back, and you can look at what you've been doing. So we'll, we'll look at that. I'm not sure what I did. Okay. Here's LIDAR image examples, a monofrequency, meaning only a single frequency of light. And the, the airplane can fly over, and as you can see on the right-hand side, it's sending down pulses, and they are coming back. You see a pulse from the canopy of the tree, you see a pulse for some shrubs, and you see a pulse for the ground. Uh, but it's even better if you go to multi-frequency, and we'll look at that in a minute. This is the same that you would get with a radar, but this was from a LIDAR. It's the lighthouse at the Key West, Fort Jefferson uh, National Monument. And the, the airplane flies by and it sends out pulses, gets them back and processes them. And you end up with uh, an image of the lighthouse and the trees and other things there. Multi-frequency, usually two. Radar flies by, and one of the frequencies will bounce off of the surface return and another off of the bottom return. And you end up with this as the uh, around Norfolk, Virginia. You can see the land mass and some buildings and other structures on the land. You can see the dark black. That's the deeper channel, and the light blue is the shoals. And you can see in the light green there, there's some mud banks with uh, rivulets, excuse me, not flowing, but probably just they're like a little uh, cutoff for your canoe to go from one place to another. Okay, image processing. Here is one uh, multi-frequency LIDAR flying, and this is mostly, or not only mostly, but frequently used in Central America. And you fly the airplane over with two frequencies. One of them picks up the surface canopy of all the trees and the jungle, and the other penetrating uh, ray picks up the stuff on the ground. And they've discovered a number of temples that nobody knew existed for the last 500 or more years because the jungle has overgrown them. And so it looks like this if you zoom in on the ground display and you can see what's really a temple there. So what? Why did he bore you with all this stuff? Well, maybe there's method in his madness, you never know. All previous examples were sensible, you could see them. We're gonna do some stuff that's got to be image processed and you won't be able to see it while it's going on in near real time. So these Nobel Prizes were non-sensible, that is we couldn't see them, sub-microscopic space, unimaginably short time frames. We need new labels for ultra small and super big stuff. So let's look at the electromagnetic frequency. On the far left you see Broadcast radio and television, uh, a higher frequency, microwaves that we have in our kitchens, and telephone and other signals. And then as you go up, you get to infrared, transmits heat, like from a radiator or your infrared stove. Visible light, things that we can see. Ultraviolet. Is absorbed by the skin and used in fluorescent tubes, but you can't see it. Our visible range goes from the near infrared to the near ultraviolet. 
Then you get higher frequencies, you're into x-rays, so they can see stuff inside us. And then even higher gamma rays are used in medicine uh, by killing off cancer cells. How many of us have had some of that wonderful work done? <laughs> okay. So this, we're not going to go too long on this, but the left-hand side shows you the energy per photon. Photon is a one single packet of a, an electromagnetic frequency. It is one waveform. And the expression for the energy is proportional to the wave, uh, to the wavelength, right? E equals H bar nu frequency, sorry. Frequency in the middle, you can see where it goes from 10 to the zero, which is like one, up to 10 to the 20. And, and what are they used for? The wavelengths are now given in meters. And, you know, if you were an amateur radio operator like I was, you had a uh, license to operate in various frequency bands. And there was like a two meter band that was used by a lot of people for portable radio communications. So lower frequencies, longer wavelengths, you have commercial power, 60 cycle. The Europeans for some reason use 50 cycle or 50 Hertz for their electrical system. And that's one way you can detect uh, Soviet submarines. If you listen to noise coming from a Soviet submarine and you see a strong line at 50 Hertz, it's not one of ours, but we were at 60 Hertz. It works. Uh, so there's AM broadcast, FM, television, radar, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, medical x-rays, all that stuff. So here are the big stuff names. If you look at the very bottom, 10 to the zero is one. And then if you have decameter, that's 10 meters, or hectare, hectare is a unit similar to an acre, it's 100 square meters. You have a kilo for kiloliter or kilometer, mega, like megawatts, and uh, gigawatts in our power systems, terawatts, and it goes right on up to nonillion, 10 to the 30. That's a bunch. So the little stuff, the 10 to the zero is still again one, but if you have a decimeter, that's a tenth of a meter, and a centigram is a hundredth of a gram, a milliliter is a thousandth of a liter, and so on down until we get down to around the middle. And if I can find the up on top. Oh, there it is. Where'd it go? Oh, look, Atto, 10 to the minus 18 quintillion. So these are the international standards for how to talk about little stuff. And the last slide was the international standards for talking about big stuff. So little things, here's some things that are small. The electron radius is 10 to the minus 15th centimeters or one femtometer. The proton radius is the same as a neutron radius, about 10 to the minus 13 or 10 picometers. And nuclear radius, again, it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Helium radius, atomic radius is 2 times 10 to the minus 11, 200 nanometers. Gold is bigger, uranium is bigger, and the nucleus is 10 to the minus 13. So here we are, we have an, an, an electron, uh, excuse me, we have an atom, neutron, a neutral nitrogen atom, seven protons, seven neutrons, and the electrons in the outer ring um, are shown there. 
So what was what was uh, going on before the Kais in 2023? This is Ahmed Zewal. He got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 99. He, it was for uh, studies of transition states of chemical reactions using femtosecond spectrometry, 10 to the minus 15, for showing that it's possible with rapid laser technique to see how atoms in a molecule move during a chemical reaction. So he, he wants to look at the stuff on the outer ring or look at the atoms themselves. So he used femtosecond laser technology to study chemical reactions, study the atoms and molecules in slow motion, so to speak, by making these high-speed pictures during a reaction to see what actually happens to the chemical bonds as they break and new ones are created. So he was using what you could say is the world's fastest camera. Technology was developed by Gerard Moreau and Donna Strickland, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2018, nine years after he used their technique. They were recognized for having invented it. So here's what he could see. There's a, a uh, benzene ring atom and you hit it with the light and it flips around a little bit, still all the same things there, but a different configuration of the atoms in the uh, benzene ring. So they're rearranged to get a new configuration. Intermediate movements are recorded by femtosecond pulses. So they're gonna be looking at how that happens and recording it. So. Here we are now this year, no, 2018. Um, they got, the prize was awarded for groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics. These are the guys that were recognized nine years after the guy got a Nobel prize for using their invention. So they developed this high intensity femtosecond, 10 to the minus 15 second optical pulses. And it used by the 1999 prize winner in chemistry. Their recognition was nine years later. So here are the ones again today. They're gonna go three orders of magnitude better than the 10 to the minus 15. They're going to have a petasecond pulse into the minus 18. So how are they going to do that? Now let's just look at a uh, harmonic oscillation. You have a, any kind of an electromagnetic radiation. The ground state gives you one loop over to the far end, but the second harmonic gives you two halves, and it goes right on down the line there. So you can see that if you can line up all of this stuff at the same frequency, but different harmonics of that frequency, we can get to a point where we can make, if you look at the upper hand right, you have the pulses and they're superimposed. And then the, as they get all put together, you can see how the multiple harmonics are changing the output of the laser pulse itself. So at the very bottom, you get an attosecond pulse. And how are they going to do this? There it is. OK. On the table here, they have a laser light in the far left-hand corner down here. The light goes, and it hits a a 45 degree angle prism, half of the light is transmitted to the left and bounced around and goes on off that way. Other half of the light goes through a delay, which can be variable. So you can uh, take your initial pulse and have a, a variable pulse come right behind it. And they're put together over here and they go through 
um, to their target. So this is the way they can make a short high powered pulse by getting rid of some of the harmonics and, and then using a delay on the, on the screen here to have a delayed pulse to come right after it. And we're gonna take a look at what that really means and what good does it do for us. So laser light interacts with atoms in a gas. I showed you the outer electrons. The outer electrons are in what's called a well. And you can see the electron is, is bound. Can't really see it, but right in here, there's a, an electric field that the electron can't get out of. And if you give it some energy, you can raise its energy level up a little bit. And then quantum mechanics says it's not continually and always bound in that well. With it will certain cases, you can prove that it will tunnel out. It can't go over the top, but it can tunnel through the well. And then as you add more energy to it, it's way up in the top. And when it falls back down, it will give you give off an energy. The Einstein photoelectric effect, electrons have in their atoms have specific frequencies to which they respond to light. And they either accept energy at that level or give it off at that level, depending whether you're hitting it with the electro optics or whether you are letting it slide back down to where it was. That's how you generate this kind of a laser. Okay, we're gonna look with a little bit of luck at the out of second technology. And I may have to go back here to get that. I don't, there, there we go. Do I need to go one more slide maybe? Pump probe technique. Here we go, this is where we need to be. Okay, there's no sound with this and with a little bit of luck, it'll run. Here you see um, some electrons or atoms that are in a pattern and you blast them with light and it in slow motion you can see what they're doing so the delay of that second pulse gives you the delay you're looking for to see how they're moving and so you can see this way they're moving And you can also uh, get different responses out of it by different timing of looking at what's going on. So each time a pulse comes in, it's going to change the configuration of these atoms back and forth. And you'll see it on the top screen. And then later, We'll put it together and you can see what's going on. So this is just a graphic of how this technique works for which the uh, three Nobel Prize winners got their prize this year. Okay, if they just run it like that, you can see how they're vibrating. And you can also see different energy levels as it goes through. So it's moving things back and forth. Kind of like plucking a violin string, you'll get the original frequency and some overtones. And this is showing the energy and the momentum of doing that as it goes up and down in the graphical display. This is not the real stuff. This is the display of how they believe this is working. So in ferromagnet materials, you can reverse the magnetism with the pump probe and line them all up the other way.
So that is how it works. And now your speaker is relaxed and, and ready to answer the questions. So you've seen the first and last slide of my talk about bare boat sailing in the Caribbean. And that's favorite picture of me, champagne that we bought in Guadeloupe for about three bucks a bottle, feet up on the steering wheel, flying back at sunset with the beautiful sunset in the background. Questions? Yes, John. Yeah, this is this is not a question, but I mentioned to Walter last week that that I had an interaction with the Nobel Committee a half a century ago, uh, which uh, tells you a little bit about how they uh, produce a group of people that they think might be uh, capable of winning the Nobel Prize. I was working at a laboratory in Long Island, and one day I received a letter from the Nobel Prize Committee. Opened it, I found that I had an invitation to nominate a person or persons for the 1975 prize, a prize. It, it didn't say what, it didn't say what, what uh, whether it was chemistry, physics, whatever it was. I'm not sure what I was selected, but I assumed and I still believe that it was because in the previous year I received an award from the American Crystallography Society. But I knew immediately who I would nominate because at our laboratory, there was a man named Ray Davis who was in our chemistry department. I was in the physics department. But Ray Davis had been working for years on the most difficult experiment I had ever heard of, measuring the number of neutrinos that come from uh, come to the Earth from the sun. Now, the, the sun is a typical star. It's a nuclear reactor that turns hydrogen into helium at very high temperatures, and it gives off the excess heat as light and as neutrinos. Astrophysicists had models of that process, that, and they were adjusted to agree to the amount of solar light energy that comes to the Earth. Ray Davis set out to verify the amount of energy that was carried by the neutrinos. He built a metal tank with a volume about equal to that of an Olympic swimming pool. And he buried it at 5,000 feet underground in an abandoned South Dakota mine, uh, South Dakota mine shaft and filled, and filled that uh, uh, container with uh, carbon tetrachloride, normal cleaning food. Now, chlorine has a small but calculable cross-section to, to react with a neutrino. Most neutrinos don't re neutrinos are flying through our body all the time and we don't we don't feel them. But it but it but with chlorine has a small but calculable cross section uh, and changes it and changes the chlorine into a radioactive form of argon. So by measuring the level of radioactivity in the tank from this radioactive argon he was hoping to determine the flux of neutrinos that went through his tank down in the, in the middle of this mine shaft. Well, with the help of the chairman of the chemistry department, I wrote and submitted a nomination for Ray Davis. Disappointed, I never received any, even a thanks from the Nobel Committee. And although this experiment was novel, and was very difficult, there was a problem with it. It was a problem that I and other people knew. Although he did careful calibrations and by introducing known amounts of radioactive argon and recovering them correctly, Davis's results were only about one third of the expected value. But Davis continued to ran, run those experiments 14 more years. And he got more statistics and better answers. 
but it got the same, basically the same answer, a third of the expected amount. Then other experimenters around the world built more expensive facilities using different detection methods, and they refined, but didn't change the basic one-third result. That finally caused the uh, theorists to examine more closely their basic theory and to make a complicated story short, it was known that there should be three types of, of neutrinos. And by the turn of the, into the 20th century, it was realized that they oscillated between one another. So that by the time they reached the earth, two thirds of the neutrinos that had originated in the sun had changed into a different kind of neutrinos, which were not discovered by, the, by the, this, uh, by his detector. And so in 2002, Ray Davis shared the Nobel Prize in Physics with a, another Japanese physicist who got the same result. So I could say by then that I nominated a Nobel Prize winner in Physics. Well done, John. The only sad part of this story is that by 2002, Ray's Alzheimer's disease had progressed to the point that his son, who was a professor of physics at the University of Chicago, had to accept the award. And he died four years later at age 91. Well, very interesting. Thanks very much. Yep. You have to be alive to win, but it doesn't mean that you have to have your mind. Right. That's right. That's one of the things you didn't mention. I've wondered how they grew, because these are all independent investigators, and uh, they're nominated like John described. He nominated one. There'll be many people nominating folks. But this committee sorts through all of these nominations and even the old ones to find the groupings that might qualify for a single Nobel Prize. Is that the process, John? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but, but in fact, the, they were independent. I mean, they did work independently. But the, the proceedings of the Nobel Prize committees are secret. And years. whoever has been nominate, uh, nominated but not received the prize will not be uh, announced until something like 50 years later. So I, I was just, just curious if were you at Cornell when Carl Sagan was there? I believe he was, but I did not have an interaction with him. Um, Hans Bethe was there, but one of the interesting things, they have a series of lectures at Cornell called the Messenger Lectures. Someone named Messenger probably gave a pile of money for the lectures. And my roommate said, we're going to these lectures every Monday night for six weeks or whatever it was. And it was on cosmology, Sir Fred Hoyle came and talked, so <laughs> it was an amazing, yeah, there were a lot of people at Cornell that were very famous and at that time and still probably are, but I did not personally know Carl Sagan. I, I heard him lecture at the University of Chicago, and he was, he was uh, very entertaining, just like the Cosmos program. Yeah. Fred Hoyle wrote a book in which he defined time, and he said, uh, if I remember, yeah, it was his book. And you get a, a cubic mile of granite, and every century a, a raven comes and sharpens its bill on this cubic uh, mile, cubic mile of granite. And when it's run down to nothing, that's one second in eternity. Uh, and he was defining eternity, uh, kind of similar to the definition of an atom to a second in it yeah. came to mind. Uh, let me ask you about uh, this, um, the possible applications of, of, the, uh, of, of these uh, changes that you've observed here in such short order. Is it possible to make faster and faster computers in such ways? Well, the discussion of the changing of the polarity of the uh, magnetism 
has some possible effect, but I don't think there's a direct effect. It's to study what's going on at the very short time frame and very small scale, atoms, electrons, and uh, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And the neutrino came about because they had performed some experiments on electron radiation from the nucleus, and they did an energy balance, and energy didn't balance, but everything else did, charge and mass, all balanced out. So some guy, possibly Fermi, said, ah, it's, it's a little bit of thing, it's a little neutrino, it's neutral. So that was the name of it, and it, it does go through nearly everything without ever interacting or stopping. And there's there's now lots of money going into a Japanese measurement program to uh, put a sphere of solid, and no, liquid, maybe solid hydrogen, something way down deep to look for more neutrinos. So it's it's a continuing quest. So why is it a mile under underground necessary? Why does it have to be a mile underground to detect? That that way you could be sure that that the thing that was changing the chlorine in the in the argon was nothing but a neutrino. So it it uh, isolates you from solar. Uh, radiation and other kinds of radiation. Now the problem might exist if you go a mile down into a uranium mine and you have other radiation there it could screw up your experiment. Well, there's also the reason neutrino that was captured in Antarctica. Right, they're down below the ice pack, what, half a mile down or something? Same reason, isolation. Yeah, I've been reading about uh the discovery of DNA and the collaboration, if you call it, between Russell, uh, between Watson and Crick and the X-ray crystographer, yeah, but the woman who used X-ray crystography, uh, yeah. Rosalind Franklin. Uh, and in, it, it seemed like in, at that time that X-ray crystography was in a very early stage, but this type of uh, uh, mechanism that's discovered in the, to be able to identify the outer seconds seems to be such a, a large step forward in terms of being able to to visualize uh, uh, molecules, et cetera, particularly in biology. Um, and do, had, have you heard or envision any uh, applications for biochemistry? I did not see anything about that. I wasn't specifically looking for it. Um, but there there possibly could be. But in biology, unless they're dead, the little molecules are moving around. <laughs> so with, with crystallography, they're just sitting there, and you can measure them. Um, and I see Laura here. Uh, I wanted to say and forgot earlier, my last conversation with Ken was when he asked me if I would give this talk, and I told him I would be glad to. So again, we're still thinking about Ken, thinking about Laura. He did so much for Oak Hammock, the ILR Science Subcommittee, and the Nobel Prizes, which he and John ran for years. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Any questions from from the ether out there, from our Zoom? Yes, we have a question from uh, either Glenn or Marilyn. Looks like Glenn to me, but uh, it's a small picture. Just unmute yourself, and you can ask the question. But you got to unmute yourself. There right. You I, I guess that's it. So I can see how this would be a very valuable tool in measuring intermediate states in chemical reactions and transition states that we always in chemistry thought were hypothetically uh, uh, steps in the reaction, but we really had no direct evidence. So, so now 
with this kind of technology, it seems like it'd be very useful. But I was wondering what other kinds of applications are uh, being used with this uh, high speed light technology? I really don't have an answer for that. Uh, it's, it's a rather new technology and it's rather esoteric as to how to do it. Uh, the example of the two lasers on the workbench is a very simple uh, construction or diagram of how this might work, but I'm sure it costs a whole pile of money and a whole lot of electricity to set this up and get it running and control temperature and everything else. Can't help you, sorry. Yeah. It's nice that you're using a laser pointer. Uh, you know, <laughs> when you, that's good. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming. Thank you very much. Uh, Walter, and uh, wish you well. Next week is actually going to take place about the time of the eclipse. So we, um, but it it's partial eclipse here. You're not going to get total eclipse. Um, so um, uh, we'll look at the timing of it. We may take an intermission and look at the sky or something. Okay, thanks for coming. <laughs>